Hi everyone and welcome back to another panel series on the theme of extremism. Uh, so after a while we're, we're excited to kind of relaunch this, this panel series. And today we're very fortunate to be joined by three prominent researchers in the field, Dr. Chris Allen, Dr. Natalie Jones and Dr. Bethan Johnson, uh, to discuss the theme or, or more likely the question, far-right extremism and youth, has the COVID-19 pandemic become a perfect storm for radicalization. Um, and, and, you know, this kind of, we've had it in quotation marks in our title, that the kind of phrase perfect storm is taken from an interview with the UK's top counter-terrorism police officer, Neil Basu, given a few months ago, in which he said that the COVID-19 pandemic has created a perfect storm for radicalization. Uh, in, in his interview, he did say that, you know, the primary threat threat of terrorism to the UK, UK was still from Islamist terrorists. He did note that the far-right extremism was growing and growing rapidly in the UK. Uh, you know, what he said was is also reflected in statistics in the country. And um, when we look at, you know, a high record of one in six terrorists who are jailed are being jailed for far-right extremism. And these include, you know, uh, the unfortunate murder of Joe Cox, uh, the, the terrorist in question, Thomas Mayer, and Jack Renshaw, a member of the band National Action, who admitted plotting to murder another MP, MP Rosie Copper, with a machete. Uh, these ideologies or, or politics of the far right are kind of dominated with, with, with ideas of white supremacy, anti-Semitism, genocide antip anticipation, and Islamophobia. Uh, where do youth come into, into this discussion and, and how perhaps has the pandemic played or a contributing factor to, to the rise is, is a question that we're looking to tackle. Um, so far-right extremism poses a risk to the youth with 10 out of 12 of under 18s who were arrested for terrorism just last year being linked to far-right extreme ideology. So that's 10 out of 12 under 18s were arrested in the UK for terrorism charges. A growing number of people and young people specifically in the UK are being drawn into hateful ideologies uh, online with predators deliberately targeting vulnerable youth who are now spending more and more time indoors and, and online due to the pandemic. Uh, so in today's discussion, we hope to kind of unravel some of the questions and, and look into the factors, uh, the use of the internet perhaps, and, and, you know, some, some answers that concerned parents or, or teachers and educators may be asking and, and how we can protect our youth. Uh, where can, you know, carers, friends and, and families, what, what should they be looking out for and who can they turn to if they're concerned about a child? Um, so, so just quickly to kind of clarify the format of today's discussion, uh, we'll have a quick presentation by, by each of our speakers. Uh, and that'll be followed up by a discussion, uh, you know, amongst ourselves and then and then followed by uh, integrating some questions that we may have from the audience into our discussion. And we do hope to end on the hour and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll be timely with that. Um, so thank you very much and, and thank you for, for our speakers for being here today and for those viewing uh, on, on YouTube. Um, without further ado, I'd like to pass a virtual mic to our first speaker of the day, Dr. Chris Allen, who is an Associate Professor in Hate Studies at the School of Criminology at the University of Leicester. Chris has been researching the themes of Islamophobia, counter-extremism and counter-terrorism for over two decades now. So Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here with us today. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm just um, going to share a screen with you and then... Um, I'll get started. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to talk uh, at, at the event this evening. I mean, this is such a, a, a kind of timely and, and, and pertinent topic to, you know, to all of us, really, and, and something which is has kind of been reflected in my research over the last, as you say, you know, 20 years now. It seems to, you know, it seems to have um, uh, uh, been far less than that. But it's been two decades where, you know, we've had so much change and there's been so much transformation and, you know, in terms of, the, you know, our society, our politics, our kind of mainstream and then the kind of the things that we accept as being normal and the things that we kind of like, you know, become mainstream, you know, is, is a period of time where, you know, sort of, you know, as, as, as you said, and you and rightly mentioned, you know, this idea that, you know, are we getting moving into this time where, you know, that we're increasingly becoming, you know, something of a perfect storm. So I mean, you know, 
<clears throat> so tonight I'm going to be just be talking to you, give you a very you know kind of quick overview. You know, yeah, just give you a kind of hopefully a little slice across the top. You know that that you know kind of hopefully set up and uh, both Natalie and Bethan to kind of you know go a little bit uh, uh, you know to kind of build on, so you've got more of a a kind of broader perspective. But I'm just going to kind of give a very very quick overview of the far right in today's UK. Look at the kind of the, the where and when the kind of emergence of kind of Islamophobia as a as a kind of and, and kind of significant discourse amongst the far right began to emerge. You know, what do, what does the far right say about Muslims and Islam? You know, because I think that's important as well, you know, so that we see the kind of changes and the transformation. And how then that fits into kind of like the kind of COVID period that we've kind of we went into and we're kind of still in and maybe we're coming out of, you know, and, and what does that kind of you know, tell us? And then give some final thoughts on, you know, kind of the relationship between the far right Islamophobia and and you, you know. Uh, the youth in, in today's Britain, and I've, I, you know, I, this was something that I kind of pulled together a few years back, you know, because one of the things that I've, I've said about the far right and, and the, the extreme right wing, and I'll, I'll make a distinction between the two in, in a moment, is that I, I would say that the far right now and, and the kind of the right wing, that extreme right wing of, of, of the political spectrum, is is now much more diversified than it's ever been in our you know in our history you know and it's much more dynamic you know you see a constant churn and development of different groups and movements and organizations you see groups with very specific identities you know trying to fill gaps in the kind of the, the, the kind of the landscape to appeal to different types of groups and so on you know and like you know and being a, a man of a certain age you know i remember back in the 80s you know and i used to go to football and you would always know who the kind of far right were. They had a very clear image. You know, they would they would dress typically as skinheads. You know, they, they would wear a badge or you know they would have a very small insignia. You could see who they were. Nowadays, you know, it's much more difficult because you know, um, you know, those who are in the far right, those who are activists in the far right, look very similar to 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 the rest of us. You know, like and, and I'm talking obviously from my own. Um, kind of race, ethnicity, identity, you know, gender, and so on. You know, um, so what we've seen now is we've seen this kind of diversity and, and you know, diversification and a kind of dynamism which has kind of come through. And I guess that some of the key things there is this move away from kind of formal organisations to kind of street movements. You know, and I'll give a few examples of that in a moment. You know, kind of moving away from kind of like you know maybe face to face stuff to kind of like online things. But I guess that the big thing there really is around the kind of ideological focus, moving away from race and say Jews and uh, Jewish communities and, and Judaism historically, to you know looking at Muslim communities, immigration, the religion of Islam, you know more contemporarily. You know, well, I'll put a very small caveat in there and say that you know since Black Lives Matter, but you know issues of race have again become you know kind of key to far right kind of discourse and, and, and ideology. So, you know, so it, as I say, you know, it, you know it, it, it's a very responsive, and very reactive and, and very dynamic kind of space. So I've, I've put together just a few like sort of, you know, sort of, you know, to try and, you know, uh, a few logos to kind of give you a kind of breakdown between what I see as the far right and the extreme right wing. The far right, I would say, are those groups that, you know, don't publicly advocate violence. You know, they're the ones that, you know, kind of like, um and, you know kind of shroud what they say so they they're, they're not typically you know overtly racist or overtly islamophobic you know they will kind of like you know they will couch things around kind of you know uh, around resistance to change they will kind of talk about defense they will say you know talk about things about takeover and so on you know and so those above the red line i would say are, are what I, I refer to as far right those below the line, I would say, are the extreme right wing. And they're groups such as National Action, Southern Creek Division, and, and, and so on. And those are the ones that I would say tend to be much more prone to be willing to use violence or do use violence, you know, either overtly or covertly. But what you can see there is you can see that there's a number of different groups. You know, you have things like Patriotic Alternative, who are, you know, a relatively new group, and they will kind of like present, you know, they will do things like cooking competition. They will have, you know, kind of things like teaching resources for children online. Um, you know, the, the infidels have got the, the, um, the, the Logan F and the Northwest infidels. They're a kind of splinter group off of, you know, kind of the English Defence League, very much a kind of grassroots, you know, street movement. And they will be very much around kind of like, you know, kind of 
you know, protesting your feet on the street, those kind of things, you know. And then you, you know, and then the one on the, the kind of right hand side, you know, the kind of the black and yellow is generational identity. And you know, it's worth picking up on those then because I'm, I'm going to be talking about those a little bit later on. But I think it's you know it's important to you know kind of like you know make that distinction between you know what I'd say is the, the, the non-violent and the violent. But of course there's there's an overlap and there's a kind of like you know a, a, a kind of gateway that exists between the two of those. So in terms of the history of you know Islamophobia, it, it, it's almost I mean you know I, I I think it's the seventh of July will be the twentieth anniversary of the of the uh, two thousand and one Bradford riots and one of the you know what we saw in the summer of the two thousand one was you know this, uh, civil disobedience and disturbances in in Oldham, Burnley, you know in in Stoke on Trent, in Hanley, you know and, and in Bradford as well. And one of the things that that was excluded or left out of the official kind of inquiries and reports around that was the role of the far right, you know, and, you know, as someone who went to Bradford in 2001 and did, you know, did, did research pretty much straight after the, the, those riots, you know, one of the things that kind of constantly came up was, the, you know, the, the role of the, of the far right. And I think that it was around that time that we saw that the far right had spotted this opportunity, you know, if you look at the kind of equalities and race relations legislation, it was very difficult to kind of like, you know, legally target, you know, racial groups, you know, so, you know, Sikhs, uh, uh, Jewish communities, you know, they were covered by the kind of race relations legislation. They were de deemed to be a racial group. Because Muslims are, you know, kind of multi-ethnic, you know, they, they weren't, they've never been referred to as, um, you know, as, a, as an, an ethnic minority or an ethnic group. And I think that the far right had kind of latched onto this and was able to go into those communities and start, start talking about how do we attack certain groups? You know, it would be attack, attack these groups because they're Muslim, don't attack them because maybe they're of Pakistani heritage. So there was there was a lot there, you know. And that's one of the, that's really where this became this first, you know, the, you know, this first become come to emerge. This idea around Islamophobia. And the leaflet here that I'm, that I'm showing is a leaflet that, that you know was um, issued by the BMP shortly after 9/11, because of course, you know, again we're on the 20th anniversary of 9/11 this year as well. And, you know, some of the things that were kind of in there was about, you know, telling the truth about Islam, you know, telling the truth about Muslim communities. And you can see there on the back of that, the British National Party really did make inroads. You know, the British National Party, again, had gone from this kind of like, you know, kind of like skinheads, you know, in the 1980s and 90s, you know, kind of look. So now we're in suits, shirts and ties and kind of mainstream themselves, kind of like moving to the political mainstream. After 7-7, you know, after the London the tax on the London public transport system, you know, they really did begin to make inroads. You know, and you can see there's some of the some of the kind of data, you know, some of the statistics. More than 50 seats across, you know, uh, across the country uh, uh, in local authority, you know, kind of um, elections, and with the official party of opposition in Barking and Dagenham, you know, and won 11 of 13 seats. And you know, someone who's originally from London and knowing the diversity within London, and particularly of Barking and Dagenham. You know that the BNP were able to become the official party of opposition. You know shows that you know like that whilst it was very localized, you know that there really was this kind of inroads made on the back purely of you know a, a kind of Islamophobic agenda. And I think you have to go you know kind of fast forward to kind of um, around about 2009 when Nick Griffin and that's Nick Griffin who was the leader of the BNP at the time. You know he gave a speech and he said we should be positioning ourselves to. Our own the growing wave of public hostility to Israel. And this really was the kind of like, you know, this was the blueprint for the far right from that time onwards. You know, it was actually sort of, you know, yeah, yeah wait, that's what we should do. You know, you can move away from these historical notions of what the far right is. You can position yourself as being, you know, non racist. You know, you can position yourself as championing, you know, kind of like civil liberties, you know, around gender, around sexuality, those kind of things. But you can you can exploit the kind of the, the, the feeling and the landscape, you know, where Islamophobia kind of exists, you know. And of course, what you see is you see a number of groups you know, coming out of this. And what I've got what I've done here is I've kind of picked on three. I've got a couple of images and I've got some text. And obviously, I'm, I won't read those texts because of time and everything. But what you can see is by looking at those is that you know these groups very very quickly and very very um, as clearly and strategically. You know, centered the whole of their ideology on Islamophobia. You know, like being against, you know, kind of like what they would call the Islamification of Britain. 
the Islamification of Europe, you know, what we see with uh, Brendan Tarrant, you know, when he, um, uh, uh, um, uh, to, um, uh, you know, um, mass shooting in Christchurch in New Zealand, this idea of the great replacement that somehow, you know, kind of white Europe was being taken over by, you know, those from, you know, those from um, uh, the Middle East, you know, from Muslims, from high birth rates, immigration and so on. And what you see here is that this idea, you know, you have this kind of thing here, it's around kind of like trying to make this distinction. It's like, we're not, we're not against Muslims, you know, we're not against them at all. You know, what we're against is some elements within their faith, you know, and of course, this is what you have publicly. And of course, what you have privately is you have a very, very, you know, kind of insidious and pernicious ideology. And same with, you know, Britain First, you see, you know, so you first have the English Defence League, you know, then you kind of emerges the Britain First, and, and you can see here a much more explicit, you know, kind of agenda around kind of mosques, you know, all of their protests and demonstrations targeted Muslim communities, you know, you have this idea around kind of like, you know, um, I mean, I was in East London at the weekend, and it was funny, I was walking around the streets where Britain First told me it was a no-go area for, um, uh, for people who looked like me, you know, and me and my partner walked through very easily. We didn't get stopped by Sharia police. You know, and I actually live in Birmingham, which, you know, Fox News says it's a Sharia-controlled city. So, you know, so I'm doing okay at the moment. Um, but what we have, you know, in those areas, you know, you also had the Britain first to in Christian control, you know, driving around the area in armoured vehicles. You know, you also had these mosque invasions, you know, and very small numbers of people were able to make a very big impact. Because what they were doing was they were doing very, you know, these very specific things in on in you know in, in real life, you know, real life settings, but they're not uploading that and using social media to, and so on to um, you know be able to kind of spread that. And I guess that um, most recently we've had you know the Football Lads Alliance and the Democratic Football Lads Alliance, and you know, this idea that you know like that they're they're not against, you know, like to any one particular group whatsoever, they're against extremism. But of course, when you ask them what form of extremism they're against. They'll talk about Islamist inspired extremism, and you can see there from the image, you know, no to Sharia law, you know. So this idea that actually sort of the problem, you know, it's like the you know, problem is extremism, but where does the problem exist? Well, the problem exists within Muslim communities and the kind of things that come from them. And so, you know, so all of my research in these groups has basically shown that there's a, a lineage between them. You know, they've all taken on, you know, Nick Griffin's kind of you know, viewpoint. We need to exploit this, and they've kind of built on this and began to go into the mainstream. Now, there's three parts of this, which is kind of like, you know, which, which you know, which underpins the far right's discourse, you know. The first is that Muslims are other, that, you know, that Muslims, you know, um, uh, you know, cannot never, can never be a part of Europe, you know, can never be a part of Britain, you know. But not only that, you know, that they will say that, well, if you ask Muslims properly, they don't want to be a part of Britain, you know, they want to come in and take over, you know. So this idea that, you know, sort of they're, they're an other, that they don't belong, you know, like this, so neither, you know, Muslims themselves nor their religion will, 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 be, will belong with. Then there's the notion of threat. And you can see this in a number of different ways. And I've given some examples there, you know, and COVID has brought a new threat in that I'll talk about shortly. You know, but you can see these kind of different ideas, you know, is it about culture? Is it about, you know, the kind of material, you know, the structure, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I live not far from Dudley, and um, 24 years ago, um, Dudley um, said that, you know, in Dudley there was a, uh, a scandal that there was going to build a super mosque in, in Dudley. Um, you know, um, and I remember when I was doing research there, somebody said, um, well, you know, like, we don't want this mosque here because it ruins the skyline of our beautiful town. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever been to Dudley, but, you know, it's a stretch to kind of find where that beautiful skyline is. But, you know, there's this idea that actually sort of there's a threat to all of these different areas. Then the final thing is, is of course, is amplification, you know, and that's what, you know, the far right will be as that would say end goal, you know, that's where what Muslims want to do, you know, that once they've taken over, once they've replaced us, you know, and actually that's where, you know, sort of that's what the end goal will be. So under COVID, what we saw was a number of things. And this is, um, you know, on the right hand side, you know, you can see down the bottom there's they've, they've included the World Health Organization logo and the Center for De Disease Control. But when you actually look, it says, well, you know, why don't you go to local Muslim areas and, of course, Jewish areas? You know, and if you're if you're you know, uh, you've tested positive for COVID, COVID, why don't you go into those areas and try and spread it? So actually, you can kind of kill some Muslims and some Jews at the same time. You know, we also saw, you know, the, the hashtag Corona Jihad, you know, this idea that actually sort of, you know, it was deliberately spreading the virus, that the problem was within Muslim communities themselves. 
And of course, you know, there was these kind of videos that were going around which say, like, you know, right, Muslims are still praying in mosques, you know, they're breaking the rules and guidelines. So, you know, so COVID provided another kind of, you know, another veneer for the far right to be able to kind of like, you know, kind of you know, move forward with their, their, their kind of discourse and the ideology. And when I said that there's a new threat which is emerging, this is this is something which, you know I find really interesting. So, um, you know, earlier this year um, there was a planning app application in uh, Piccadilly Circus to convert part of the the old you know the old Trump um, uh, building um, into a kind of prayer space. And um, you know that you know the kind of opposition to mosques and so on you know is not something new. You know, the far right have become very very good at opposing mosques and you know kind of really kind of taking it forward. But what was interesting with this one is that you know the, the, the Britain first actually said, well, you know, it's not now about the culture, it's not now about the religion. You know, it's the fact that because a lot of people will be coming into this area who happen to be Muslim. You know, it will increase the risk of, you know, kind of like, you know, spreading coronavirus, COVID, you know, it will actually be a health risk. And so what we see there is that, you know, and I think that this will become something which is, become, you know, this is a new trend that will emerge. The kind of the biology, you know, the biological threat that Muslims present. Now, I, I, I realise that I've probably spoken for too long already, so I'll be very, very quick in, in these last two minutes. In terms of where we are now, what we have is we have these groups, which are particularly now in the far right, looking at a, a drawing of the young audience. So here we have like, you know, kind of generational identity. You know, they, they, are, um, they are from the identitarian movement in, in, on the mainstream of Europe, you know, have come to Britain and kind of shaped it into something which would appeal, hopefully, to Britain's youth. You can see there that this was a, a genuine article from the Times. They were described as hits the fascists. You know, and it says that, you know, like, so they're being rebranded with skinny jeans, trainers, and honey words, you know, like, so, you know, the, you know, this, the article itself, you know, the, the piece was, was, was awful, you know, it was actually saying, well, look how great these people look, you know, they look like young people, they're educated, you know, we should take them seriously, you know, we shouldn't worry about what their ideology is, you know, because they look great, you know, they look like hipsters, you know. But this is one of the things, you know, so what you saw with this is that you saw a group that was like, you know, the, um, the, the leader was, you know, educated at the University of Bristol. His dad was um, uh, a kind of hedge fund manager in the city of London. You have a very different image, you know, to what we've seen previously. Even if you compare Britain first and England eventually with generational identity, you have a very, very different approach. So all of these different angles, these different perspectives of the kind of youth and demographic, you know, you're seeing now the far right kind of move into there. My favourite thing about generational identity is they used to have a dating app as well. So if you're a right wing fascist, you can find other right wing fascists to date. You know, so um, it's like Tinder for the far right. Um, and then, um, of course, then we go into the kind of the more violent side. You know, and this is the these are images from you know kind of national action. You know, national action. You know, as you mentioned at the start, you know, um, kind of celebrated the murder of um, Joe Cox. You know, uh, celebrated the kind of like the act actions of Thomas Mary, of course. You know, you know murdered um, uh, Joe Cox. And what you see here is these images. You know, you see like you know the 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 Nike swoosh. You know, and just do it. You know, alongside their flags. You know, this image. You know, kind of creating a very street image. About, you know, using streetwear to attract young people, and on the left-hand side, the kind of means which will appeal to a much younger demographic. You know, and you know, and National Action were themselves, you know, a group that said that they only wanted to, to appeal to a young audience in the UK. So to wrap up, and I realise, you know, yeah, again, I apologise. You know, what we have here is, that, uh, and I've just seen a spelling mistake. Sorry. And um, so we get to this stage of, of, of uh, a perfect storm. We have COVID, we have social isolation, we have more time online, we have right-wing extremism, you know, this notion of a perfect storm. We have young people that are going to, you know, see that it's a different world. They have disillusionment with government, they have disillusion with the mainstream. You know, young people always want to be kind of slightly rebellious to their older generations. But what they see in part of this, of you know, that research from the BBC shows, was that they see that Britain's changing, and part of that is because of visibility of strong religious practices. So young people have grown up in this kind of post 9-11 space, you know, the students that I teach now that come in, you know, they, you know, 9-11 uh, happened before they were born, you know, they've grown up in this post 9-11, in this prevent world, you know, where, you know, kind of securitization, you know, the kind of problematization of Muslim communities is the norm, you know, where it's unquestioned, but also where, you know, kind of Islamophobic, you know, kind of tropes and Islamophobic stereotypes, are also very much a normal as well. It's all part of the mainstream. 
And those figures there at the bottom show that this is a very, very real problem. You know, what these figures show is this relates to the extreme right wing, but if we're seeing this with the extreme right wing, then what are we seeing in terms of the kind of softer, the more normalized, the kind of more respectable or legitimized part of the far right? So, you know, as I say, I think that, yes, we are definitely in this place where a perfect storm is. I think that, yes, Islamophobia is going to form a, a very strong part of this. But what we will see is we will see this kind of pick and mix approach, bringing different things in. But actually, at the root of this will be the kind of far right you know, ideology against uh, Muslims and against the religion of Islam. And I think that it, the, the greatest problem, the greatest threat comes from uh, those youth, uh, from the youth demographic. Thank you very much. Sorry, and sorry for going around and over. So, Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. I mean, I took uh, several notes as you were speaking, and I've I've got a couple of questions that that I want to come back to you, but but later on. Uh, thank you ever so much for, for kind of putting together both the history and and the current uh, together to give us a more enriched uh, insight into um, the far right and youth. Uh, so thank you very much. Now we are on to our second speaker uh, of the evening, Dr. Natalie James, an associate professor at the School of International Relations and Politics at the University of Nottingham. Natalie is an expert in the field of counterterrorism and the program Prevent. Uh, Natalie, thank you for being here with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am just going to share my screen as well. Bear with me a second. There we go, okay. Um, so yeah, so a uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, and my, I'm going to tip off directly from those statistics that um, Dr. Chris Allen was just talking about then and, and focus on the role of prevent um, uh, and the role of education in that. So for those who aren't aware, the Prevent is part of the UK's counterterrorism strategy, and it's one of the four strands um, of the larger contest strategy. Um, and the Prevent duty came out of that, and it was statutorised by the 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act. And Prevent, as it says in the uh, title, is to prevent the um, individuals from becoming engaged in terrorism and extremism. And the 2015 uh, Counterterrorism and Security Act that introduced the Prevent Duty essentially mandated that responsibility to prevent. So it made public sectors were so public sector workers, sorry, responsible for showing due regard in the need to prevent people from becoming engaged in these spaces of terrorism and extremism. It effectively put a legal duty on them to uh, ensure that they were preventing people from engaging in those spaces. And that applied, as I say, to all public sector workers, but particularly for the education sector, which is where uh, my focus is in my research. This resulted in two different mechanisms. So the first one being a safeguarding mechanism and the notion of channel. Now, Channel is the UK's uh, UK government's safeguarding, multi-agency safeguarding hub. And what that means in practice is that they have different individuals from across the public sector. So educationalists, they have mental health experts, um, housing experts, uh, people who work in social care, et cetera, et cetera. And those individuals that, across the public sector will come together um, and pr provide a safeguarding service to individuals who are deemed at risk. So I'll talk a little bit more about that referral process in a moment. But the channel is, is essentially the safeguarding hub where those safeguarding referrals over people who might raise concerns over potentially being involved in these spaces would then be referred to and where channel would then take over uh, an assessment of that particular referral. So that was the first mechanism that it brought in for the education sector, that referral mechanism where people would be responsible for referring individuals of concern or that they were concerned about. And the second avenue through which it came through the education sector uh, and that first one was replicable across the across the public sector but the second one British values was more specific for the education sector itself and that was the embedding of what was la labeled at the beginning fundamental British values but we now more, re more uh, recently refer to it as just British values was this embedding of uh, an agenda that would promote the idea of a sense of, uh, of values that were distinct to the British identity and um, that would therefore act as what I refer to as the antithesis of extremist values. In other words, those values, if one embedded them, would enable one to reject the values that were promoted by extremist terrorists. And so the importance of the education sector really comes in through, firstly, the mandation of the responsibility to prevent people from becoming engaged in these spaces. 
but also because what we've seen since the, the 2015 Counterterrorism and Security Act is that the education sector has consistently accounted year upon year for around a third of all referrals since it came in. And it also, interestingly, which we don't yet have very much information on, is the sector which has the highest number of referrals back out to it. So what can happen is when the different public sector, uh, different public sectors, sorry, refer into channel that I was talking about before, where channel doesn't deem it necessary for channel support, um, for perhaps you know a, a mentor through the provision of a channel to work with an individual, it might then send that that person of concern out to different public sector agencies. And the education sector is the sector which receives the highest number of people being pushed back out to it as well. So it's at this really interesting um, point at which we see the duty being kind of engaging the most with the duty in terms of the number of referrals, but also being the, the sector that appears to be statistically relied upon the highest in order to provide support as well. And as uh, Dr. Chris Allen referred to earlier, the far right are now taking up as well the majority of referrals. And interestingly, we can't quite figure out, um, or the, well, the government know, but they will not release whether, where those referrals are coming from specifically. So we can't trace the kind of the nature of what referral comes to where. So we can't make causal claims on um, that the education sector are responsible for the vast majority of far right referrals. But what we can say is the education sector account for a third of referrals. And what we are seeing is those trends increasing where what we saw in um, kind of back in 2015, 16, where around about um, 40 percent were uh, of Islamist related concerns and around 10 percent far right. What we've actually seen is a, a shift in that. Um, and we now see the inclusion of what's known as um, unstable or uncategorized referrals of ide ideologies. But the far right has now taken over that and they're hitting around about that 30 to 40 percent mark as well. So the research that I'm going to talk about today is based on my interest in that area, uh, interest in finding out more about how those referrals occur and, and what happens to the individuals who are responsible for those referrals and experiencing them. Um, and it's based on a four year research project which examined experiences of that very duty and that very responsibility. And it did that across five different institutions in Greater Manchester's further education sector. And it's also based on some work that I have done uh, based on Dr. Lakani's work, who's based at Sussex. Uh, he led a British Academy project that looked again around experiences of the duty in the Sussex area um, and based on some of the conclusions that we drew out of that as well. So much of the conclusions I'm going to speak about are based on that empirical data. So, as I say, there's two key ways in which the prevent duty becomes applied in this sector and the way in which the radicalisation is tried to be uh, prevented. And that first one is around safeguarding against vulnerability to radicalisation. And in this vein, what we see is the prevent duty frame radicalization as a form of harm in the same way that it would something like child sexual exploitation or substance misuse, gang violence, uh, all those different kind of forms of harm that we see traditionally within the spaces of safeguarding. Radicalization to ex and potential involvement in extremism and terrorism was seen in the same vein. It was framed through the same rhetoric and the same um, language as that as a form of harm. And what that meant was in the same way that we might spot the signs of, uh, of abuse or of, um, of harm to an individual, we could also spot the signs of radicalization. And this feeds into this kind of wider idea that radicalization runs as a process. It runs as a uh, kind of one step into the next to the next, and we can disrupt at those, multi at those different points. And that's kind of what prevent built upon is that the earlier we intervene, the more likely we are to stop those individuals from engaging in those spaces. And so the kind of the in practice, what that meant was that an individual, so a teacher, for example, might spot such signs of radicalizations uh, occurring in, in a particular individual or student in their class, would then refer through formal uh, channels within their institution, so would write a referral into their uh, designated safeguarding lead, for example, and that would then be referred to channel and support given. Now, it doesn't quite work like that. It's a bit more complex. And actually, what tends to happen is the reality of what this looks like on the ground is that concerns would be raised by a teacher because they might see something that they were concerned of in that individual. They would then go through a process of having informal dialogue with colleagues, maybe. Have you seen this? Do you notice a change? You know, has such a body uh, mentioned anything about this particular uh, concerning idea to you? 
Am I right to be concerned about this? And then that formal dialogue would internally would occur with a, a designated safeguarding lead who would be responsible for uh, trying to weigh up whether the, their concern warranted any further uh, action. And that DSL would then, if they did feel it warranted that, would then potentially have some informal dialogue again prior to that official referral route, have some informal dialogue with external agencies so they might ask for advice. A teacher has spotted this, can you let us know if we think that these, this needs referring? And quite often what would happen as well is dialogue would also occur with the student so that the teacher or the designated safeguarding lead, the DSL, might well speak to that student and their family and say, these concerns have been raised, you know, can you account for them? Is everything okay? Do we need any support? Because the importance of recognising that is because what happens in this process then is it isn't kind of just the, um, there's been a lot of criticism around prevent and I, you know, admittedly, I'm by no means an advocate of it, but the reality of prevent on the ground is actually we've been able to see that there are multiple different processes that are occurring in uh, individuals trying to engage in this process of prevention. And, and as I say, we you see a lot of those through uh, empirical research, we see a lot of those different processes occurring where people are taking the time to understand, are these concerns relevant, are these concerns important for the spaces of de-radicalisation? And again, then, only once those informal dialogues and advice and um, guidance was sought would that referral be made. But then again, of course, uh, referrals being referrals, you then come across the potential um, implications of whether or not that's then provided with support once it gets referred externally or whether it's rejected. And as I mentioned earlier, it's take, brought back into those institutions, those public sector agencies and said, no, it doesn't quite warrant the support yet. You deal with it for now which raises, of course, uh, implications in and of itself. However, what is important to know is through this mechanism, what it allows is for institutions uh, of education to be able to embed this agenda into their existing mechanisms of safeguarding. So would they go through all of those processes of internal dialogue and, um, and uh, for informal communication with colleagues because that's generally what teachers do with any means of safeguarding if they have any concerns over safeguarding they tend to discuss it with colleagues to ensure that they are warranted in their concern over it so it allowed them to embed this practice of safeguarding uh, against radicalization into those existing mechanisms it was essentially a continuation of existing practice and that in some respect then de-exceptionalized this whole counter-terrorism agenda and strategy to make it something that already existed within their practice but of course one of the dangers that we have with that is some of the challenges that then became faced were well how do we if we're spotting signs of vulnerability what is vulnerability how is vulnerability to radicalization different to vulnerability to cse or different to vulnerability to substance misuse and of course that is a very difficult thing for teachers for anybody to be able to spot and it's something that actually is, is still not completely understood within the sector um which is as Kind of my, my research demonstrated and that's not to take away from a teacher's ability to but actually the just the, the difficulty of being able to recognize what are these so-called signs of vulnerability and that again then brings you back to that point where teachers actually were trying to work off those existing frameworks to use their existing knowledge and expertise in order to judge is there a concern here and do i need to ensure that this person is protected against whatever form of harm i think they might be experienced experiencing or exposed to and so the focus then becomes on rather than trying to embed in that history that um, Chris was talking about before around securitization of trying to focus on supporting students through recognizing these forms of harm as opposed to securitizing them. And again, that kind of then involves things like, do we need extra resource to try and do this? How do we understand um, when the, the concern becomes radicalization? And I'll come back to that in just a moment. That second element then is British values. So as I say, we have the safeguarding mechanism, which enables staff to embed that through existing mechanisms, but we've created some challenges in how we spot vulnerability to radicalization as opposed to vulnerability to something like CSE. And that second tenet of British values being the antithesis to threat. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea that 
essentially, if we, if we embody these British values, if we embody the notions of the rule of law, of democracy, of mutual respect, of tolerance of others and people of different faiths, and if we embed, uh, embody individual liberty, that essentially we have the ability, we have the values that would enable us to reject those which are promoted by extremists or terrorists, because they are the opposite of the rule of law, democracy, mutual respect, tolerance, individual liberty. That was the idea in practice. And a the, the way in which that was tried to be rolled out originally was through the notion that this would be naturally embedded within the classroom, that it would be something that teachers could draw on naturally as they talked about different level elements of the community, uh, of the curriculum, sorry. In reality, what happened was this kind of got embedded through posters and tutorial sessions. So rather than being kind of naturally embedded into existing conversation, it was more about there's a poster on the wall with British values or we're going to do one 45 minute session um, on what British values are uh, and here's how to spot them. And actually, that wasn't necessarily an issue of institutions. It was an issue of not being able to have the resources and the time and the space to embed them into the existing curriculum. There was a potential that it could have been viewed as an extension of the social, moral, spiritual and cultural values that had been embedded for decades in educational uh, curriculums anyway. Essentially, those values were already in the system. It was that repackaging of them of being particularly British that the duty brought in that was different. And it was that that had quite a, a presented quite a challenge for many staff because trying to embed this idea of British values into the classroom was seen as very difficult for teachers who taught things like automotive or hairdressing or even art and actually what it was found was it was certain subjects where it was easier to do that so history social sciences humanities the sort of the, the subjects that would be traditionally academic and traditionally um, inviting of conversation were more likely to lead to the sorts of um, discussions that would be able to embed these values in um, more explicitly into the curriculum. And so the subject really mattered when it came to this side of the agenda. But actually what we found was that many students in fact found it quite patronising and they found it quite meaningless as well. Students were aware of what British values were but they didn't really know what they were in terms of the rule of law, democracy, et cetera. And they found it quite patronizing that at 17, 18 years old, they were being told to be a good person, you need to understand and engage in democratic processes. And as I say, once again, the kind of the, the lack of space and time in order to do this was really problematic. The biggest issue, however, was Britishness. This notion of that these values that had the potential to, have, to be a continuation of exist, existing practice through the SMSC value agenda, like the safeguarding aspects of prevented, actually wasn't here with British values because of that changing language around Britishness. And that fed into a really damaging idea of that these values were only available to so-called British identities, to people who accounted to this idea of Britishness. And as I'll come back to that notion in a moment. And so essentially, to kind of summarise, countering the far right through prevent them, through these two means, saw so that actually there was a, a serious challenge to its ability to be able to Im be implemented specifically to the far right. In terms of the safeguarding then, as Chris alluded to before, you know, we had this history of prevent in a post 9-11 context where it was associated almost in its entirety to the prevention of uh, of uh, terrorist terrorism and extremism that was linked primarily to Islamist ideologies. So Prevent was associated with stopping Muslims from becoming terrorists at a very simple, uh, a basic and problematic level. And so actually trying to understand what the signs were in the applicability of this agenda to far right was incredibly difficult when we had a political a, a media and a public discourse and narrative that was so strong that surrounded this kind of anti-Islam and, and the, this notion that terrorism simply meant Islamist extremism, to then apply that to the far right was something that was very difficult to do because of that wider and that stigmatizing narrative that had informed it for so long. And there was also difficulty in, well, how do we know where there's kind of a repetition of simply what students have heard from the parents or from people on the street of, of, of general kind of as, as problematic as it is of general Islamophobia how do we know where that turns into things like hatred and hate and and, um, and racism and how do we know when that then turns into far-right extremism where do the lines between those different 
elements as problematic as each one of those are, where do the lines lie? At what point does prevent and radicalization concern become involved? Because remember, the point of channel, the point of prevent is to prevent engagement in extremism, terrorism. Where does that hit before those others do? One of the positive outcomes of prevent is that we saw that teachers were able to engage in policy enactment. They were able to engage in those informal dialogues to be able to ensure that they were trying to avoid where that happened. And there were multiple instances where teachers were aware of those damaging consequences, those damaging narratives that surrounded them and their need to try and avoid them in their practice. And so that focus on safeguarding and protecting harms really drove that ability to try and respond to the far right. But it still requires more uh, work on it. It still requires more support and guidance for those educationalists. And then that second one, which is far more problematic, actually, on this notion of Britishness, because that notion of Britishness was tied to a promotion of ethno-nationalism. And this feeds really well into what Chris was talking about when we see that kind of almost the, the, the utilisation of some of these mainstream problematic discourses by these organisations, where actually it was the, the idea that we would then be promoting a sense of national identity was quite divisive and stigmatizing particularly where there were diverse communities within educational institutions and that fed into that wider notion of exclusionary politics of of these policies like um anti-immigration policies the Brexit issues that we were facing at the time and the Windrush scandal as well a lot of the kind of anti-islam and islamophobic notions that were around it fed into that notion of them that we were promoting this very narrow ethno-nationalist sense of Britishness and there was a fear that was very real for many of the participants that actually this fed into the, the far right's narratives that this agenda of British values could be utilized by the far right through these narratives of otherness and these notions of in-groups and out-groups and again, what we saw, thankfully, was a lot of educationalists recognise this and a lot of them try to work against that and instead focus on this idea of our values and institutional values to do that, to take away that language of Britishness in order to try and avoid that perpetuation of ethno-nationalism. And just kind of final key messages of what we need to then think about going forward is whether or not we're providing educationalists and co the colleagues across the public sector with sufficient training and resources to be able to understand where that differentiation potentially lies between hate, hate crime, extremism and terrorism. What sort of what are the so-called signs of the far right, if there even are any signs that we need that are available to us to look for and if that's the right approach to it and also the ability to then apply that on the ground. I would also encourage us to think about repackaging this idea of British, as I've just kind of talked about then, this notion that values can be British and promotion of national identity as British in a backdrop of that stigmatisation and divisive narratives is very problematic. And actually, should we be focused instead on providing the time and the space in the curriculum for critical thinking, for media literacy and for open debate, rather than trying to promote this notion of Britishness as a means in which to antithesize the threat of the far right and uh, alternative ideologies within this space. Thank you very much. Apologies. I've also no doubt gone over time, uh, but thank you for your listening today. No, thank you ever so much, Natalie, for, for kind of bringing the discussion in into the spaces kind of occupied by the youth, occupied by by the vulnerable group that, that we're kind of here to, to discuss today. I mean, I've taken several notes and, and have my questions ready. Um, so I'm looking forward to the Q&A session at the end for that. Um, but now, last but not least, of course, we're on to our last speaker, Dr. Bethan Johnson, a doctoral fellow at the Centre for Analysis of the Radical Right. Bethan is currently researching the contemporary far right in Western nations, with a particular emphasis on terrorism. Uh, so Bethan, thank you ever so much for being here with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's see if I can get technologically savvy enough to do this. Um, someone set up a flare or something if it isn't going right. But no, thank you very much for, um, for having me come to speak with you. Um, I am really committed to talking about this topic um, with regards to tackling particularly youth, child and youth exploitation um, within right-wing extremism and right-wing terrorism. I think obviously as our two panelists have talked about, um, it's, a, it's a 
huge issue and one that uh, the government and other institutions are trying to tackle um, to varying degrees of success. Um, and I think really the first step is recognizing that there is a problem um, and, and really internalizing that in all of the different variations of that. Because I think sometimes we'd like to think of this as a problem that's happening sort of somewhere else, someplace else to other people's children or would never happen in our sphere when in fact there are many, many instances in, in which that's not the case and we need to really grapple with um, what that would mean. Uh, for us to see youth in our community engaged in this kind of belief system and these kinds of activities. Um, and actually, I want to begin uh, by sort of telling a story that might illuminate the degree to which this is a problem and how it comes to be. Um, and actually, that story is one of only a few months ago where a 16 year old boy from Cornwall was standing in front of a judge um, and found himself being sentenced to 12 counts of terrorism related offenses, um, two of them disseminate, for disseminating terrorist materials. Um, he faced judgment for actions that he hadn't committed at 16, but actually something that he'd done three years earlier at the age of 13. Um, and 13 is actually the youngest age at which um, we've had someone who's been engaging in terrorist activities be arrested and face trial. Um, for those kinds of offenses. Um, 13 is also the unlucky number, as it were, of uh, the age of the alleged leader of one of the largest um, and most known, at least, uh, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist terrorist groups that's been prescribed in the UK, that is Fear Creek Division. Um, the 13-year-old in question, um, the alleged leader of FKD, uh, is a 13-year-old Estonian boy, or was at the beginning of um, the group, and, and that sort of signals the, this issue. Um, 13 is an incredibly young age, um, we would think. Um, and in many cases, the story I've just highlighted is part of a much broader um, issue that's happening across the UK, though, across the world as well. And I've put um, I've put some of the figures up for arrest records or arrests uh, and um, criminal proceedings related to terrorism against teenagers. Um, and so you can see uh, the number of individuals not only charged or questioned, but actually convicted of terrorism related offenses um, related to the radical right. Um, and actually, when we see these numbers, 16, 17, even 15, that hides the fact that these are often individuals who have been engaging in this um, sort of scene for some time, that they might be convicted, for instance, at 17. But again, this is something that they've been a part of for some time. Um, well, Natalie is right to point out all the different mechanisms by which prevent um, can be engaged for young people. Um, it is not necessarily always the case that the that system works very rapidly. Um, and so people are actually have the opportunity to be in that space for quite some time before they're detected. So in many cases, um, when we're seeing a 16 or 17 year old, we're talking about a recruitment at 13, 14 and 15, um, which is, I would again say, is incredibly young. And, and just to sort of bring this home a little bit is to, to put up the faces of some individuals who have been um, convicted. These aren't private. These have been in the news. I, I'm not sort of outing anyone in a way that's dangerous um, to their safety in that way. But these are some teenagers who in Britain have been convicted of terrorism related crimes. And you can just see on a, on a real level how young um, these boys are. And I would say that um, they, again, it's not just that they're facing charges for obscurity, like this is terrorism, they're disseminating terrorist material, they're plotting terrorist attacks, it's very serious. Um, and we think about our own teenage years, most of us are not planning on engaging in terrorism or compiling information on how to kill many other people. So this is, in many cases, a very serious and exceptional Thing. And so we need to be asking ourselves lots of questions about what prompts people to do this, what prompts these young people to do this. Um, and so I work on this issue. And so people are asking me all the time, like, are white boys the next frontier for the far right? Or what do I do um, if I see someone who is becoming subject to radicalization? Um, especially if it's not in the homestead. So someone, a friend, a teacher, not a teacher, but a friend or a grandparent or a cousin. How do I respond? What do I do? Um, and so I think 
that we often also believe that a we have that maxim which is like age is just a number and in many cases we need to be thinking that that is true in terms of recruitment but, and in terms of violence as well um, we often are we may be as a society unwilling to recognize the extent to which young people can engage in terrorist activities and uh, or to take them less seriously because they are youth but in fact we need to be taking them very seriously and we need to be doing everything we can uh, on an interpersonal level as well as governmental levels to to make this um, unappealing to make this um, something that people do not engage in and if they are engaging in are getting help disengaging from uh, in the future and that can come from a variety of different sources um, and, and so I think that we need to be really clear about what that is um, and how we move forward. So in order to do that, we can ask ourselves a series of questions. The first one is a kind of who question. So like who, I've shown you some of these numbers, but like who are the radical actors and in turn, who's recruiting them? So in many of these cases, the radical actors with regards to recruitment are themselves white males. They're traditionally in their 20s and 30s, they're usually socially isolated. However, we need to also acknowledge the extent to which that traditionally 20s and 30s is growing, is going down, is becoming younger and younger. So uh, the Estonian boy who set up FKD was 13. There are many instances in, instances in which um, recruiters will claim to be 20 and 30, but in fact, they are much younger. So these groups will say that right 16 is the youngest they'll take members but in fact because of the nature of the internet which is how most of this recruitment will happen as i'll discuss um, in fact people are accepting individuals who are much younger and that's because recruiters themselves are also younger than they say so uh, but by and large these are white males cisgender and largely heterosexual though we can't always know that to be true but the white maleness of it is typical um and they are engaging in sort of a print of anything that they think of as appealing to youth um and so i would say that in terms of who's being recruited it's people largely under the age of 18 now or there's a focus now on those under the age of 18 in many cases under the age of 16 they are disproportionately boys who are being recruited though there are some girls as well um, usually we find from speaking with those um, who work on this issue on the ground so law enforcement teachers social workers etc is they tend to either have troubled home lives or troubled interpersonal lives uh, and they're struggling in some way. Um, they're socially isolated and they're also looking for a sense of identity. Um, and when they're going and they're trying to find themselves, one of the places they go is the internet. They try to find communities where they fit in or where they feel support. Um, and so they go to social media platforms um, that they think can provide them answers. Um, they want to know why they're isolated. They want to know why they're struggling. They want to know why no one will date them or let them into the schools that they want or why the future looks less good. And they go online and what they end up finding is a lot of um, individuals who have primed themselves to give a very simple answer, which is it's the other's fault, the racial other, the religious other, the ethnic other, the like other gender, any number of answers, but it's, it's always externalized. Um, and so they go on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and they see that. Um, and so we think about recruitment as happening by and large these days in the online space. There's still interpersonal recruitment to a certain extent, so siblings, parents, friends, but a lot of it is happening online. Uh, and I would note that it often happens, it moves gradually from more mainstream sites to further offline spaces. So Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are getting better at detecting these things. And so now people are being pushed more towards Gab and Fortune and Reddit, where free speech beliefs have allowed things to um, sort of play. It plays into their hand more in terms of what is allowed to be said and is tolerable rhetoric. Um, but you see then that also progresses to more encrypted end-to-end -end encrypted channels. So you've got Telegram and WhatsApp and Steam and, and other wire, other groups 
uh, or other spaces and channels where they can talk more privately. And that's where a lot of recruitment will happen. It's not really as face-to-face -face as we'd like to think, which also makes it much more difficult to detect and for people in their personal lives to not necessarily know about because it's not like a person with his skinned head is like showing up to your door knocking on and asking for your child. So it's much harder to find. Um, I would also say the other space is gaming. I'm not a fan of blaming gaming for everything, like lots of people always say, but there is a correlation, we believe, between um, gaming, particularly first-person shooter gaming, um, and, and youth recruitment. And that happens largely because, one, it's sort of seen as training young people to engage in violence and normalizing bloodshed, but also because many of these have headsets. So you talk to someone and there's not necessarily the same kind of um, evidence that can link you to recruitment in the same way if it's happening over a headpiece or an earpiece live. Um, so again, and it's something that lots of kids have access to. Social media and gaming are things that lots of people wouldn't necessarily know of as being spaces for recruitment. So that's sort of the where, and what are they doing? So just quickly, they're talking about any number of things. So they have huge amount of violent content, but outside of that is talks that like memes that are supposed to be amusing, references to pop culture, discussions about sports, a lot of stuff about politics. So trying to talk about UKIP or written first or other things. So like increasingly spirals out into more and more extreme things, conspiracy theories and otherwise chatter about video games and also dating, like people who are in cell, even not just in cells, but people who are struggling to find partners who want to talk about girls um, can find that in these spaces. And, and basically the, the, the upshot of the argument is we'll be your support system. We'll be your friends. We'll talk about all of this. We'll have a fun time um, talking about this. You can also commiserate. And then at the end of it, we're going to sort of feed you these incredibly intolerant ideas. So they don't necessarily start out with violent content right off the jump for young people. And so the question then becomes the why. So like, why is this appealing to young people? And why is it particularly appealing to young people now um, in COVID? Because we are seeing a huge increase in youth engagement with um, terroristic ideas in COVID. Um, I would say that young people are incredibly vulnerable to um, messages about isolation and struggling to fit in. We talk about identity crises that young people have generally um, when they're reaching that age trying to figure out who they are. So they are vulnerable to this um, in looking for a sense of self. And this is a quite simplistic, these, many of these are quite simplistic narratives. Um, that are easy to onboard for young people, that are easy to conceptualize, however fringe they might be. Also, if you're looking to be a rebel as a teen, as many of us are, it's a fringe idea. It's, a, it's an all-encompassing way of setting yourself aside and setting yourself apart. Um, they also, they have fewer personal relationships that can mitigate against this, potentially, especially if they feel isolated. Um, so they often have more of a reason to be looking for friends online. They're not having coworkers if they are struggling at school or they don't have a girlfriend, they might be looking for more friends and they fall into this trap really easily. And they do also have less experience of diverse societies. Like they haven't moved about potentially a lot or if they have, they haven't created roots in a diverse space that would mitigate against embracing these ideas. Um, and the other question in terms of the why is why do people vol why do the people recruit youth? Why, why is it an appealing demographic? And it's that same thing. They're easy targets. Um, they also have all the necessary materials to engage in terrorism. Um, they need a knife or a car or a gun. And, and those things are much more accessible um, than they ever were. We can look at school shootings, for instance, in the United States and see that young people can be incredibly violent. Um, given the right materials. So in many ways, they're less resilient to um, the recruitment narratives than adults might be, and they have all the materials that are needed. Um, and I think we really need to grapple with the idea that this is not just, that this is really a problem because potentially we're, we're struggling to encourage young people to see themselves as part of a diverse society that is a good thing. Um, 
And so what can we do moving forward? Because we know that COVID is creating such an issue for young people. We've seen, I think it's like an eight, 800% spike in visits to certain terroristic websites. And I think what we can be doing is we need to be doing a mixture of work between the government and nonprofits, family and friends and educators to really educate ourselves uh, on what, uh, what this recruitment has looked like in COVID. So the government with prevent and other policies, because I'm I have my own criticisms about prevent or concerns about prevent, let's say, um, can continue to do more, can continue to have conversations about designating terrorist groups, identifying terrorist content, calling out conspiracy theories and problematic rhetoric. Nonprofits should be putting out as much information as possible about what recruitment looks like, what signs are. Um, of recruitment, popular texts, popular channels, so that people can know. Educators, it's very difficult in the space of online uh, e-learning, but can continue, I think, to create narratives in young people that emphasize the benefits of living in a diverse society. That so many of the narratives that are targeted at youth in COVID are about making them forget what Britain and what many countries, liberal democracies have gained across time from living with diversity and embracing egalitarianism. So educators continuing to do their part by reminding uh, students of what a good thing these values are. Um, and also all the horrors that are committed by individuals who embrace fascism and racism, anti-Semitism, the, the dangers of that and the real world violence that has happened historically because of it. And then finally, family and friends, we have a resp responsibility, uh, not just for youth, but for youth in particular, to call out problematic narratives, to question uh, conspiracy theories when they're put in front of us, to not normalize any of this kind of slippage. And conversely, to encourage people to remember the strength that we have from the diversities that we have in liberal Western democracies, that we benefit from living in the societies in which we do. And while we might not be able to interact the same way as we did three years ago before COVID, we still have a richness to society um, from this. And, and that encouragement and that constant positive discussion about the way things are, can help combat, in my opinion, the sort of declinist, incredibly negative narrative that the radical right relies on to recruit anyone, but particularly youth. Um, and I think that those are things that help combat this perfect storm that we're seeing. It just takes a lot of time and effort to do, but we are fully equipped to do it. It's not a silver bullet, but all of these things working together can help us deal with the complex issue that will be uh, us dealing with the aftermath of COVID. Um, and that's sort of all that I have to say, but I look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Bethan, for, for ending on perhaps a more hopeful note um, and, and you know looking into the future. Um, so thank you again for, for being here with us. Um, for the Q&A session, I kind of wanted to start off by, by asking if any of uh, you guys had any questions for one another um, on, on the presentations. We do have a few questions in the YouTube chat. Um, so I'm just following those as well. I just wondered if any of you had any questions for each other that, that you wanted to start off with. Okay, that's fine if we don't. Um, I'll, I'll start to with, with the YouTube questions. Um, I mean, the last questions we've got come through is kind of uh, really linked to what we've been seeing in, in the press today and, uh, you know, very recently with MPs comments on the white working class children being let down and left behind in the education sector. Is that a factor which plays a role and has been playing a role perhaps in, in far right extremism? Yep, Chris. You are. Yes. So yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's funny when you said about questions. Um, I, I had actually written down about weaponizing the the, the, the white working class. You know, because mm. I think that you know when 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 all of us are talking about these topics, you know, one of the things that kind of comes through is is the issue of whiteness. You know, as Natalie was saying, around kind of notions of Britishness, and you know the the kind of racialization of, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of the, you know, national identities and so on. And, and I think the one of the things that's interesting for me is that, you know, I think that one one of the problems that, that, that I've seen is that 
in the same way that we look back in the way in which, say, prevent, you know, kind of homogenized Muslims, you know, Muslims as, you know, kind of like, you know, all being very much the same, you know, or having the same kind of like, you know, capabilities, the same views and beliefs and so on. I do worry that, that actually now when we go down the route of the kind of the far right and, and the extreme right wing, that, that it's going to be very easy for politicians to kind of place that blame and kind of other the white working class, you know. And I think that this, this is something that, that I kind of see in terms of this, you know, this kind of, you know, the kind of weaponization of, of the white working class, you know. I think that what we've seen today with the kind of the, the report around education is, you know, in many ways, a kind of cynical approach from the government, you know, and, and I'm no fan of this government, you know, as, as you know, if anyone's seen any of my writings, like, you know, <laughs> they, they know I'm not a Tory, right? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, like, I think that one of the things that we've seen with this is that, you know, um, you can see that it's being used, you know, the, the, the kind of concept or notion of white working class is being used as a way of kind of like, you know, kind of like making, um, make, demarcating from ethnic minorities you know around race you know and i think that when we get into this kind of space as well you know and, and you know from what natalie was saying you know i think that it's very easy for the government and and for the security services to kind of go well we're dealing with you know the far right now you know and paying lip service to it that it's you know this is a problem in one space white working class let's problematize those you know and we can kind of do exactly the same as with them as what we've done with muslims and then you kind of get this kind of lip service but i think that you know as, as beth and has also shown you know this is a much this is a much wider problem you know it, it's actually not something which is restricted to a kind of very narrow kind of class understanding you know but but i do think that you know like the working class is becoming something which is you know increasingly uh, politicized and increasingly weaponized as well would anyone else like to add yeah, so I would say that it's very true. I think this idea, again, of putting the onus on um, any individual or de specific demographic. Um, and that I mean that both with regards to white working class, but also with educators, as if somehow that the education sector alone is like what has failed or anything like that is like deeply problematic because it it misses the fact that these things are interconnected and political rhetoric plays a role, uh, plays such a strong role in how uh, people are um, embracing or view certain topics. I think that that's important. I would say at the same time, it is important to to temper the the response to that, which is we should be thinking about how the government is educating everybody, including the white working class with regards to this. So as I said in the presentation, I think it is important to make sure that in the education that we're providing to all Britons or that we are attentive to the narratives that we put out and are encouraging um, communities, different people to see that there's a strength and diversity that exists um, and, and to combat the declinist narrative that we often um, may be uh, inclined to embrace. Um, and I just think that, that there is a benefit in, in, there's a benefit in being cautious about reverting too much of the position, which is it's not this community, it's not that, it, it isn't just this community, but this is part of a broader thing, which is there are white working class boys and girls who are engaging this as well as white uh, wealthy and affluent boys and girls who do this. So we need to be thinking about both sectors, but we shouldn't have the response, which is, well, it isn't a problem. We're like putting this step, we're putting everything on this demographic and we shouldn't, and it's because of a classist thing. It, can be if we think of it as only being a problem for that community. Um, what we need to be doing is saying, actually, there's something about whiteness, there's something about the way that we're educating people, the way that our political rhetoric is talking, um, that's being politically mobilized. When I say there's something about whiteness, I mean like as a construct of race and how people conceptualize how they should be treated, how they should have power or not have power in society. But I think, um, there is an extent to which as well, we need to recognize that working class individuals are also often being the ones who are targets of recruitment. So being attentive to the idea that there is a perception among some in the radical right that working class individuals are more amenable to their beliefs, so they are potentially more subject to recruitment. So trying to, it's a complex thing and everyone wants this really quick 
solution um, and to say, well, it's this group or it's that group or it's everybody all the time when in fact, there's just many different um, factors at play. But I am always hesitant and critical of any discussion that says white working class people need to do this or educators need to do better. And in fact, really what it is is many people in many communities need to do better and we can set up what is a not fun, but a complex ecosystem that helps support everybody and is responsive to where the threat is coming from and who is headed towards. Yeah, and I would just add that I completely agree with both Bethan and Chris that um, I think that it is a much wider question of actually putting responsibility on uh, wider systems that be and, and recognising that actually a lot of the wider narratives that we're seeing in policy in public in media discourses actually play a huge part in this and and facilitating this notion that exactly as Bethan said that it is a an easy blame game for they're responsible and so we don't have to do anything about it actually we we as a society need to ta start taking far greater responsibility for the language for the discourses for the narratives that we are creating and perpetuating and accepting by doing nothing about that are playing into the, the the very same narratives that create the working the white working class as as a as a community in the same way that we created all Muslims as one community and the damaging effects that that is potentially going to have. Uh, I mean, thank you very much for kind of uh, from that question, kind of unpacking um, race as a concept and, and communities as a concept. Perhaps um, I, I kind of wanted to bring in two things that both Natalie and, and Bethan kind of focused on. Um, first, you know, the benefits of, of diversity in our society and as, as a liberal democracy, and perhaps teaching this to, to youth through, through the education system. And also what, what Natalie brought up on, on how, you know, the Britishness of, of British values perhaps was packaged to tackle Islamist uh, extremism and to successful or not is, is something debatable, but that, that's kind of how it came about. And now we're trying to use the same mechanisms to tackle uh, far right extremism in, in, in the youth and, and for perhaps many youth they see this kind of British values as being defended through their right wing activism uh, you know perhaps democracy they see Islam as a threat to democracy so they think that you know through their activism they are protecting British values and Britishness itself um, I mean would you like to comment further on this and, and how how can perhaps uh, and I know it's a difficult question, but, you know, these safeguarding mechanisms that we have in place be changed to, to kind of protect the most vulnerable. And I really like that when Bethan started, she did say, you know, it, it was a form of child and youth exploitation. And I think that's just, just clearly what it is. And I think many times we don't see it as that. We see the terrorist as, as the terrorist and not someone who's, who's been exploited and, and the victim themselves, especially when we're talking about youth, you know, children as young as 13, as Bethan gave examples for. Um, so, so, I mean, there are a lot of kind of ethno-nationalism and, and concepts linked together here. Um, it, it's a broad, it's not a question in itself, but, but is there anything you'd like to kind of add to that or, or bring into that as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right. You know, it's a, so British values was this notion that we could effectively create this antithesis to extremist and terrorist threats through trying to embed and, and employ these values that of and, and you know within them themselves the recognition of of, of the uh, pluralism and the, the, the diversity and and the, the positive attributes that come with being in a society um, that comes with the, the those very notions or those very values in Britain but this idea that they are distinctively British almost ignores the fact that you don't have to be in Britain to live in a democracy uh, as it, you know uh, on a very simplistic level but I think we for me the uh, and for many of my participants but this is also a, a very personal opinion as well from from the experiences that I've had engaging with people and my my own understanding of the, the narrative is promoting this idea of Britishness for me and and there are academics who do disagree and, and that's absolutely fine and but promoting the idea that these values only pertain to a particular form of identity ignores the ability for anybody else who doesn't necessarily identify as British to be able to engage in them and that immediately when you tie it in with an, 
a, a strategy that is aimed at primarily preventing extremism and terrorism in whatever form that might be, whether it is far right, whether it's far left, whether it's uh, Islamist extremism or terrorism. When you tie that agenda together, you are immediately saying that anything that falls outside of that idea of Britishness is a threat and must be countered. And that, for me, is the incredibly problematic element of this particular strategy because it ties the two together. So this idea of being British is not problematic. You can have a British identity, you can have a sense of national pride, that is not problematic. What is problematic is when you tie that idea of being non-British to being a threat. Um, and that for me is where the, the real challenge lies and it allows for that scope to be, for that, that narrative and the, the national identity to be weaponized by these organizations who, you know, who try to promote this idea of, of Britishness and anything outside of that is a threat. The two essentially are arguing the same thing with very, very different motives, but they are running on the same narratives and that is incredibly problematic and dangerous for me. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, Bethan, I think you've got your hand raised, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm a trained historian and the idea that there is a static concept of Britishness is like inherently flawed. Um, the British values that we have now would not be things that 300, 400, even 100 years ago, people would have considered to be British values. So to me, when someone says I'm defending British values, I think, well, what does that mean? Whose values are those? Is that really what Britishness is to you? Because it could be, but we need to, again, be having these conversations in our interpersonal spaces, in our classrooms, in our politics, that talk about the fact that Britishness ha has changed. Our values are changing, just like our demographics. We wouldn't want to be living in a place of British values of 400 years ago, of 600. It, it just wouldn't be something that we would want. Um, and so I think that this idea of being a defender of British values uh, is one that is ahistorical and we can tell people that. And I, I know there is an extent to which you ask some of the people that we study and they're like, actually, no, I do think that like the right to vote for women or the like citizenship of minorities or the treatment of Catholics or any number of things, I'm fine with those values because I do agree that those are a problem. But I think that there are still ways for us to help encourage people to see the degree to which values are a flexible system. Uh, and that we are strengthened by the fact that we have movable values across time. And, and I think if challenged, lots of people would say, oh, actually, is that a British value? Is that something that I would like to continue to be a British value? And I, I mean, as a personal matter, I'm not a huge uh, a fan of or positive respondent to discussions in politics around British values. I think it, as Natalie points out, creates an isolationist if this is British and this is, thereby other people don't have this. And, and we know that's false. I think it's also just not that helpful for us to, um, norm or essentialize everybody's values as being one thing. Um, and I think that, again, that, that speaks to this idea that we want to sort of not deal with the issue of how we live in a multicultural society in which people have competing values or beliefs or what have you, and, and that that actually can be a strength. We have core beliefs about human rights, for instance, or other things, but those aren't British. Those are human or humanist or something else. I just think that for me, um, we can do a lot more in the mainstream when we, if we get rid of talking about or are more clear about when we say British values, what that means and model in the mainstream, um, the degree to which those values have changed so that young people in particular, because I'm glad that you pointed out the extent to which I think there's a kind of simultaneous exploitation of children to recruitment while them still doing horrible terroristic things like it's not one or the other um, but if we can model that for the next generation and generations they won't feel as under threat because i think so much of this comes from a negative narrative that is reliant on the idea that there's something static that's trying to be changed as opposed to something that has always been flexible and dynamic that is continuing to change over time 
Um, and if we can really break that down in the mainstream, I think it can have a really big impact um, in terms of going forward and recruitment moving in, in the next period of time. If I, if I could just come in on that as well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I really despair about Britishness. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm very proud to be British. You know, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, you know, I don't have a problem with, with my identity as being British and being identified as a British person. Um, but like, there is this, uh, you know, one of the things that, that, that you know, I despair about is the constant looking back, you know, the looking back at, at what, you know, how we, how we conceptualise or, or, you know, how Britishness is conceptualised in the public and political spaces. And I think that that's always a real problem for me. And, and, and as Bethan said, you know, you know, no, notions of Britishness and, and of our identity, a collective identity, you know, needs to be much more dynamic. And I always think that, you know, we should be looking forward, you know, Brit, you know where, where Britain is a much more diverse, you know, kind of society and nation. You know, rather than what it is, you know, kind of like if we if we look back and and embedded within that is this, you know, kind of exceptionalism as well. You know, that point that Natalie's saying that that somehow these values are, you know, kind of like you know sacrosanct to being British, where in fact, you know, they're they're actually sort of you know, if you take British out, you know, those values kind of go in in most liberal democratic kind of societies, you know, nations nations sense. And I think that just to kind of bring it onto the, 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 the far right, one of the things that you will find with this is that it's a very easy um, a narrative to navigate from within the far right, because the far right will say, we are defending British values. You know, so they, they, they will put their cards very much on the table and say, we are defending British values. You know, and we are defending those, the British values from, you know, the threat of the other, you know, i.e. the threat of Muslims, the, the threat of immigrants, the threat of, you know, all of these kind of different things, you know, groups and so on that they see as being other. You know, they will all say that we are, we uphold the rule of law, we uphold, you know, kind of <clears throat> democracy, you know, we agree with freedom, with liberty, you know, all these kind of things. And you see this increasingly with the adoption of by the far right rather than the extreme right wing of, of things around, you know, championing gender rights, you know, championing freedom of speech. I mean, my God, we live in a country where probably the, the greatest advocate of free speech is Tommy Robinson, you know, like, and that in itself is, you know, like, you know, indicative of the, of the society we live in. But I think that, you know, like that, and that's one of the problems with this, you know, like, is the way in which, the, the, you know, it kind of demarcates, you know, there's, there's a kind of underlying demarcation going on. It's that, it's that this is who we are and this is who they are, you know, and we are this and they are that. And, and I think that I always come back to that point, you know, the, the, there was a headline that was a front page of a Sunday, the Sunday Mail, the Mail on Sunday, I can't remember if it's the Sunday Mail or Mail on Sunday, back in 2014. And the headline was, um, Cameron tells Muslims, be more British. Now, I mean, I don't know how to be more British or be less British. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know why, you know, how Muslims can do that, you know, in themselves. But I think that what that did is that, that just that, that headline, you know, captures for me exactly where this problem is it's about demarcating the, the us from the them you know and, and that kind of is in there and and in the us sadly the far right can position themselves very much in who we are you know and you know demarcate themselves from muslims and all of those you know threatening others that you know are in the them so that, that's where i have the problem with that Yeah, thank you very much. Bethan, were you about to say something? You unmiked. Okay. Um, I, I do have more questions, but we're half an hour over as well. So I don't want to tire, tire any of you or, or those viewing. Um, you know, perhaps we can, we can catch up and discuss these either, either through writing or, or, or another session later on as well. Um, because, I mean, Chris, you mentioned, you know, the biological uh, element of, of the far right and, and in relation to Islamophobia, you know, I was really wondered if there was a link to eugenics and perhaps other further texts written before and, and for Beth and again I had questions for you and Natalie I had questions for you. But I'm gonna save them and, and not ask them now and, and kind of leave us on on on, on that cliffhanger to, to, to contemplate on it, um, hopefully. Uh, but thank you very much for all three of you being here. Um, I know you've all got other commitments and and Natalie's on a holiday. It's Chris's second uh, talk of the day, and, and Bethan had a meeting just prior. Um, so you know, thank you all for for being here and and you know engaging in the discussion and, and debate. Um, hopefully, you know we can continue it further, um, and and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. 
and, and Natalie, have a lovely holiday. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm not sure if we can enjoy the rest of the evening because I'm going to be watching England play Czech yeah. Republic. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. You know, if anybody wants to study on uh, English identity and the exceptionalism of Englishness, you know, watch ITV's coverage. It'll all be there, you know. Waiting. Indeed. Yeah. No, I would say I have a good holiday as a as a Welsh person. I, I can't say like good luck, like good luck. I guess conceptually as British, I'll, I'll tip my hat in that way. So you as an English <laughs> non Englishman as a Welshman, I have to sort of say, well, <laughs> Czech Republic was lovely too. But uh, yeah. no, um, thank you for having me. And anyone who has questions can I think I put my Twitter up, but. I uh, am happy to answer them or come back in the chat because I think it's really important as, as we can all see. Yeah, Thank thanks you. very much, everyone. Great meeting you all as well. Really yeah, good. lovely. Thank you very much, everyone.